about to go into our aft motor room and our aft engine room. What's important is, so this hatch here, this was not here originally. We cut this hole and actually installed the hatch to make it easier for tours to come in and for our volunteers to bring equipment in and out. So originally the only way to get in and out of here would have been these vertical ladders on either side. Let's see if the tour is over here. Alright, we can uh, start over here. Let's take a day from now. Wow. Oh, wow. Look at that engine. <laughs> Watch Wait. your head. So, like I said earlier, we have four engine bays, uh, engineering bays on board. B1, 2, 3, and 4. B1 and B2 are in front of us in the forward part of the ship. In B1, you have two of your engines. In B2, you have your motors. Everything in B1 and B2 is also in B3 and B4. Uh, so, everything you've seen here is forward as well. So, the first thing I like to point out to people. Down here is one of two eight-cylinder diesel generators on board the ship. This is what was used to power electricity on board. This one does still work. We actually just ran it uh, in September of this year. Uh, anytime we leave Albany, say for dry dock, we go to Staten Island at Cadell's. We're not hooked up to shore power anymore, but we still need electricity. So we throw some diesel in this, power it up, goes to your electric switchboard here, and sends electricity everywhere it needs to go. This is live because we are hooked up to shore power. It's power a small village with something. It looks like, like a... Actually, some destroyer escorts, uh, especially in the Philippines, when the war was over, they would park them in the harbor, run basically extension cords um, to substations on shore and power the city or the town. Wow. Yeah. We are basically a power plant. Around the corner, we have an air compressor. So the Slater was initially outfitted with a set of torpedoes, three torpedoes, uh, but you needed air to fire them off. So this is what would have fired the torpedoes off. They took the torpedoes off, I believe, in August of 1944, and uh, they kept this though. Uh, we are below, well, we're right about the water level if we were fully loaded in service. So getting this out of the ship without physically taking it apart would mean cutting a hole in the deck above us or in the side of the ship. Hmm. You're not gonna do that. So they just kept it in place. Here you get a closer look of our 16 cylinder diesels. They're essentially locomotive engines. We have four of them, uh, two of them are right here. The engines probably have not run since 1990, 1991, somewhere around there. Um, right before the Greeks decided to get rid of the ship. In the early 2000s, some of volunteers did throw water in these engines and were able to hand crank them and turn them over a little bit. So they are loose as of 20 years ago. Um, to get everything in perfect working order though, it's gonna cost millions upon millions of dollars to do that. And then you gotta maintain all of it. And we just don't have one, the funding, and two, the, the crew capable to do it. Our, our volunteers are getting up there in age, so it'd be very hard to run and maintain these engines. So we do not have any plans in the future for Slater to get her going under her own power. But we don't, we try not to do anything to the ship that future generations can't uh, undo. So if someone comes along in the future, decides to give us $10 million to get this up and running, um, go ahead. But as of right now, we, chances are we'll never do it. So. There's essentially a locomotive engine, train engine. Uh, what is really interesting about these so we have four of them and we have had the ship since 97 so 25 years now and we just learned earlier this spring that three of the engines that are currently on board slater are original to slater world war ii one of the engines in our forward engine room is from a world war ii submarine uss jack uh, they operate in the pacific they actually sank a bunch of japanese ships in 1958, somewhere around there, late 1950s, we actually gave 
the jack to the Greeks. And at the same time, the Slater was over there. The Greeks gave the jack back to us in the late 60s, and then we then sunk it as a target in the Mediterranean. But the serial numbers on one of our engines in the forward engine room matches the serial number on the jack. So at some point in the about 10 years, the Slater and the jack were in the Greek Navy together. The engine was taken off the jack, and somehow they were able to put it into the Slater. We have no idea why. We don't know how they did it. We actually have almost... We have next to no information about Slater's Greek service, and it's 40 years. We have some Greek documents. We, don't, we haven't translated them. Right. Um, otherwise, it's hard to figure out what Slater did. I suppose it makes sense. It's a, another foreign nation's navy. It's yeah. some secret. And it was still, you know, at the tail end of her service, it's still kind of modern. So I'm sure a lot of stuff is still classified. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just hard to initiate that conversation with a foreign country, especially when they don't speak English as their main language so hmm. um, but that is one of my goals try to learn what Slater's uh, service in Greeks in Greece uh, was what's great is we do know Slater was used as a training vessel for a very long time for Greek sailors so over 5,000 sailors trained aboard Slater a lot of them were still around and they do show up occasionally just last week we had um, an Itos so Slater crew member from Greece show up on a day we were closed, but we gave him a tour and he loved it. Amazing. So. All right, we can head to the motor room. So basically how this works is you throw diesel into these engines. They then power generators, which are in the other room. Why, why not just have the diesel engines running the shafts directly? directly? So there was a destroyer escort design class that did do that. Problem is you need reduction gears. Mm. Late in the war, they were using reduction gears on a lot of ships. They ran into a production issue. So they didn't do that with us. Mm. So the generators are directly below us. We're standing right above them. So your diesel is powering your generators. Which then creates electricity and send it to this board. This is where you actually control the speed of your ship. So your engine order telegraph is down here. So the black is the pilot house. Whatever they set it up to, you'll go down, the bell will go off. You then match it. You then send this, the message back saying, I got your message. You then look at your chart here, your table, figure out how many RPMs we need to go a certain speed, based on if we want both shafts going, just one, things like that. Once you figure that out, you're then coming over, increasing, decreasing the amount of electricity coming from the generators to your motors over here. Your motors are now powered up and they are directly attached to your, to your shafts. Uh, so in these big gray boxes are the, are the motors. Correct. And then this is actually what it is, turning your shaft and making your ship go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, your firefighting gear in every compartment on board the ship, so it's CO2 extinguishers. You have a three-cylinder emergency generator di directly below us, just like the eight-cylinder service generator. This does work. Uh, this is used in the event of emergency. You can throw some diesel into it, power it up, and it will power this electric board, and you can allocate electricity to certain systems. So some of us call this the Frankenstein machine. <laughs> um, so uh, Germans had, on top of acoustic torpedoes, they had magnetic mines. So these mines, you didn't have to actually hit them for them to explode. You could be you know, 20 feet away and the mine will sense a change in the magnetic field around it and explode. We are a steel ship, so we have a magnetic field around us. So if we don't see those mines, they're underwater, we can trigger them and potentially sink. Uh, the USS Rich was a destroyer escort that was part of the Normandy invasion on D-Day. On June 8th, two days later, they actually triggered three mines and sank right off Normandy. So this system, basically there's wires running along the hull. You send electricity into those wires and it won't demagnetize the ship, 
but it will severely lower your, your magnetic field. So now if that mine was gonna trigger when you're 50 feet away from it, now maybe you have to be 10 feet away. Gives your lookouts a little more time to see that mine, uh, your sonar guys to, to recognize it, and then you can steer away. Or you can get guys on your guns, shoot those mines and cause them to explode. What is that process called when you're running current? Degaussing. Degaussing, oh, De like, like the old TVs. We used to... Basically, yeah. Okay. A fully operational machine shop. Oh wow, super cool. So none of this equipment is really original to Slater. Uh, the lathe is a more modern lathe that the Greeks uh, had installed on the ship. And it was just too big for them to take it off. We do have a World War II lathe that would have been on the ship. It's in storage, um, but it's just such a hassle to get it on board. But, you know, we have someone here basically every day of the week, at least one person, fixing, working on something. So this is probably one of the most active rooms on the ship. Even in the winter when we shut down for the tours, so we shut down the end of November, we don't open up till April. So for those winter months, we move all of our work indoors, and this room is heated. A lot of guys just hang out here all day. Oh wait, I gotta get a shot of this. The five rules of welding and making love. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so we're always looking for welders or anyone who just wants to paint. Um, there's always painting to do. So this is today a continuation of the machine shop, but this was not part of the machine shop in World War II. This was one of two 20 millimeter clipping rooms on board the ship. So you would lower your 20 millimeter canisters that are empty through this scuttle above us. The guys would grab it, bring it inside and reload it. Well, this is the hatch that you were showing me up yep. on deck. Correct, the 20 millimeters right above us. And then your midship's passageway is right behind me. So that's just a hallway that goes down the center of the ship. Uh, that way, if it's a storm outside, you don't have to go outside to get from one end to the other. Mm. Here we have the pilot house. It's where you steer the ship. So your helmsman is the guy who's actually turning your steering wheel. This is original from 1944 when the ship was built. Of course, while he's steering, he's gonna look out his windows here, his portholes. You can see they're kind of small. You can't see a whole lot. So he's relying on his compasses. You have your electric compass that's connected to your gyro, your master gyro, very accurate. But remember, redundancy, you want two of everything. If your ship takes some damage and you lose electricity, this isn't gonna work anymore. So you have your old school magnetic compass and you can navigate the ship just by using that. In really bad weather, or you're in combat, you would cover your windows with the steel plates. Give you a little more protection. Problem is, now you can't see anything. So he's, it's like driving your car and you can't see out your windshield, except his car weighs 2,000 tons and there's 200 some odd guys on board. So he's gonna continue navigating via compass, but again, the flying bridge above us comes into play. They can see everything up there. If he wants a course change, he just yells into this speaking tube down to your helmsman and say, change your, your course to whatever. And he can do that. So he's driving blind, but he has to rely on the guys above him. A few other things we have. Chronometer, this pendulum. That's gonna be going side to side as the ship is sailing. If you're going through a storm, you don't take your eyes off that. You'll notice it doesn't go above 70 degrees. Capsizing for destroyer escort was about 70 degrees, 72 degrees, give or take. The most I've read for the Slater, she went about 50 degrees. So you're not close to capsizing at that point, but I'm sure the guys had their life jackets on. They're grabbing onto things. The most a destroyer squirt has ever rolled to one side without capsizing, in, in, from what I've read, a destroyer squirt hit 78 degrees on their chronometer. Somehow they did not capsize. At that point, it's almost, you're basically walking on the walls in here. Engine order telegraph. This will indirectly control the speed of your ship. 
you set it to your desired speed. You can also set engine RPMs. You then send the signal down to the engine room. There's a similar device. The engineer will hear some bells go off. He'll check to see how fast or slow we want to go. He'll then have to do some math based on the number of engines we need, RPMs, things like that, and adjust the speed of your ship. So it might be a couple minutes until you see a speed change. Top speed of the Slater was 21 knots. That's just over 24 miles per hour. We could inch, uh, eke out a little bit more if we really wanted to, but basically top speed is 24 miles per hour. It doesn't sound that fast, but in reality it kind of is. Since we're mainly protecting against German U-boats, we only have to go faster than the U-boat. Just outrun them or chase them down. So a U-boat for most of the war, if they were underwater, they could go seven knots, give or take, very slow. Um, on the surface, they can only go a little bit faster. So we were still faster than them when they surfaced. Um, later in the war though, the Germans developed the Type 21 U-boats. Underwater, those could go just as fast as the Slater. So the whole idea of just altering your convoy, you know, 100 miles south and just not even deal with the U-boat, if the war had been prolonged, that probably wouldn't have been able to happen. And the Slater may have gone and attacked other U-boats. Fortunately, we're faster than U-boats. There were destroyer escorts that were uh, boilers, steam. They could go upwards of 28 knots if they really pushed at. Those are your destroyer escorts that are escorting your carriers and your battleships, your capital ships. Uh, we're just too slow to do that. That's why we mainly serve in the Atlantic. This is the magnetic compass. It's mounted on gimbals so that as the ship moves, it'll stay relatively flat. Now you have a technical challenge because you have a magnetic compass in the steel room. So these two big iron balls are on brackets that adjust and you can move them closer and further away until you zero out the compass so it points north even in the steel pilot house. Oh, interesting. Not a problem you would have had in sailing ships because you didn't have the metal to distract the compass. But once you start building things out of metal, you have to adapt the compass to its new surrounding. You also have a gyro compass that will give the helmsman the heading of the ship. Right, and the details for the gyro compass are coming from somewhere else, right? Correct. Gyro compass compartment is down below, underneath the mess deck. Okay, so why would you, is this just redundancies? That... Exactly. Gyro compass is dependent on electricity. If we've lost electricity, I can still figure out where I'm going. Is, the, w w is there an advantage to the gyro compass other than redundancy? It's going to be more accurate, I think. You know, this depends upon your eye reading it, whereas this is pretty detailed. But it really is about having multiple systems. Pretty much everything on the ship has got multiple ways to do that same task. And that's because in combat, you can't predict what systems are going to be knocked out and what systems are going to be left intact. So who is typically in this room? You've got the helmsman. The helmsman, the lee helmsman, the officer of the deck might be here. Might have a couple of other people manning phones and doing other things. They haven't been able to lock down the staffing level here in the pilot house for us. I can't help but notice these giant <laughs> machine guns behind yeah. us. Uh, first off, they're not real. They are reproductions, uh, but they're very well-made reproductions. Uh, they have the ability to be hooked up to propane, and you can actually pretend you're firing them. So the story with these is unconfirmed. We don't really know if it's true. Uh, so the summer of 1945, the Slater is sent to the Pacific to fight Japan. So everyone knows Japan had the kamikaze aircraft, the suicide planes, but they also had suicide boats. Those boats were crewed by one guy. They had explosive, explosives on the front, and they would just charge in, crash in your ship, and explode. Our guns, at a certain point, can't look over the side to engage them. So our captain wanted these to go on either side of the bridge so they could look directly down in the event one of those suicide boats attacked us. Story is, the Navy wouldn't give it to him. So he went out and he acquired them. He basically traded some liquor that we had on board the ship to some Marines, and they gave him the guns. It's probably true. That kind of thing happened all the time in World War II. But who knows? He did have his machine of snow crate mounts for them, and they mounted them on either side in the pilot house. Uh, right here. Take one more. We're now outside on our signal bridge. It's a mirror image on both sides of the ship. 
we do have our 24 inch wide searchlight. Uh, General Electric built these. Uh, for those of you who do not know, General Electric is actually stationed just up river from here. It's connected to New York. So a lot of the stuff was built right up here or at their other, their other locations. And now it's back here in Albany. Very powerful this. If you turn on full brightness at night, on a clear night, you can see it to the horizon. That could be 10 miles away. So you need to be very careful when you use this because you turn that on, if there's an enemy U-boat out there, they're gonna see you. And you probably can't see them. So the signal bridge, we have a searchlight to see around the ship at night. We also have a signal light. World War II convoys tended not to transmit by radio because the German U-boats had radio direction finders. If I transmit, they can't break the code of the message, but they'll use the signal itself to find the convoy. So within the convoy, more typically, Morse code by light, short and long bursts of light. And this is what you see in the movies all the time. Now there is also a short uh, distance line of sight radio called TBS that I can use to talk to ships in the convoy if I can see them. The problem with that is it's unencrypted. If the Germans find that frequency, they can listen to our transmissions and I won't know it. So I have to watch what I say on TBS. So I've got to be careful and not give anything away when I'm transmitting on TBS. But because the signal is only line of sight, the U-boats can't use the signal to find the convoy. It's the long distance radio that gives us away. Mm -hmm. And that's why you never transmit in convoy unless there's a terrible emergency. Mm -hmm. I point out to people that the Navy still teaches sailors signal flag, signal light, and semaphore. Signal flags go back to the 17th century. But obviously all these forms of communication do not depend upon electronics. They don't even depend upon power. So here's your redundancy again. I have multiple ways to communicate. Mm. How do you? Not bad. So Steve is one of our radio guys. They have most of this equipment go. working. We can both send and transmit. And during historic ship weekends, these guys talk to other ships around the country. My well, name's Steve Sartesky. I've been a volunteer here in the radio room helping to restore equipment for the past almost eight years now. It's been just about eight years. I think I'm hearing my eighth year. For a while, for three years, I was the only volunteer because there was a pause. The original crew um, couldn't come up. There's some reasons why they couldn't come up anymore. And, and then they, 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 they come up still once in a while. A few of them still show up every once in a while. Yeah. So what was the most important radio in here? If you could pick one. God, if you had to have one. Um, I'd have to say any receiver that could receive in the CW portion of the band. Because nine, when, you're, when you're on the middle of Pacific, 99.99% was .99 all that, CW. For right. Only when you get into ports or in harbors if you maybe use, you know, the phone portion. Like this does CW too. This does about 400 watts. Right, so okay. CW for the layman is a Morse code, right? It's a continuous wave. Mm -hmm. Right, and do you have a, the mechanism here? The, uh... the code keys, I right? Yeah. The original ones are actually still in here. Oh, wow. This is a uh, kind of a sponging out the connection of the signal bug here. Look at that. If you look down in there, and there's another one on the other end there, and there's another one over here too. Oh, I see. They're kind of recessed. Okay. 
There's yeah. another one in here too, but it's just they're kind of hidden. Right, right. That one we use the most because it's right next to the unit. So. Right. And oh, so this is one that you don't tap, but it, you tap on the side. Yes, yeah, back and forth. Dot, right. Dot, 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 dot. right. Right, right, right. My CW is a bit rusty. Could you uh, just demonstrate with your finger? You don't have. I mean, it doesn't have to be. Accurate. I, I am terrible. I, I got. I didn't. I could. I could do 10, 15 words a minute one time, but I went. Yeah. Right. We have another guy who may be back on the ship soon. Okay. CQ, CQ. I can do a few. I fall out there. I get. I, I'm rusty. I got to get back in the. Wow. So uh, most of this radio equipment was uh, in here. Is it, did the radio well, room they, look like this at the time, or? Well, they always. They, they, I mean, my, even my own uncle would say that they never. Most ships never had their original radio configuration. Right. Those things would break down. They get replacements from other ships. They fix things, they jury rig this, they jury rig that. I'm told that there's a very good possibility that this particular receiver was original to the ship. Mm -hmm. Can't confirm it though. Uh, it's not a manifest. The bottom number is on a manifest, the original called factory manifest. But that particular one may or may not be. We, 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 there's a serial number, and to, to, to research it down to that degree is, is probably almost you know impossible. This well, transmitter was working back in the day. It needed a lot of maintenance work. They hadn't been operated in a while. Right. If you want to record this, if everything's still on, you can still on, it's still on. You get to push this button. Push that brown button right there. Now it's done with standby. Wait about 10 minutes and you can start operating it. Wow. Well, the tube's lighting up in there. You see if you can get a shot out of it. Oh, yeah. people like Steve who dedicate their time and energy and who are specialists in their field are tremendously valuable to us. You know, I can't weld. You don't want me running a welder, trust me. But people like him and the other restoration people work here are phenomenal. Mm. So I don't know if you want shots here in the ship's office and the captain's cabin. You'll notice we've gone back to the green paint scheme. Because again, this is a restricted area for the enlisted men. So who's, yeah, so who's, I know that this is your director's office now, Tim. Yes. Um, so actually. He hides his computer around the corner so you can see it. <laughs> um, so who would have been in this office and what this is this? This would be office? mostly, they're called yeoman and they're the ship's clerks. They're handling a lot of the paperwork. Now at battle stations, they have a battle station job when the ship's in combat, but their normal job is processing paperwork. And these are good guys to know. These guys issue the Liberty Passes. Yeah. They also help the officers with the pay. And good people will be friends with. Mm -hmm.